I really don't like my family. Now I know that sounds horrible, I just never got along with my parents and by extension my entire extended family. We were just very different people with very different ideologies. When I was 18, I moved away for almost 10 years. I moved back a year ago and I've been slowly rekindling my relationship with my family. As an adult, I realized that we can have different ideologies and still love each other. Family is family after all and I'm fortunate enough to have a family. Last year was my first birthday back in my hometown since I was 18 and it was an experience to say the least. My parents decided to throw me a surprise birthday party which already lost points in my book. I appreciated the gesture of course but surprises are not my thing. My parents decided to invite my entire extended family, many of my aunts, uncles and cousins that I haven't seen in over 10 years. I was more surprised by the turnout of the party than the actual surprise itself. After the initial shock of the surprise, I actually started to have a good time. It was nice being able to talk to some family that I hadn't seen in many years. We talked about football, jobs, and life. It was becoming clear to me that I just needed to grow up and move away for a little while in order to have a good time with these people. Things got a little weird when I talked to my great aunt, Angela. She was one of the few aunts that I liked before I left. We would talk about Adam Sandler movies on holidays when I was a kid, and I thought that that was so cool since the rest of my family was so uptight, but Aunt Angela wasn't doing great. She had dementia or something along those lines. I'm sorry I don't know the exact medical condition, but I can say that it did really warp her brain. When I tried talking to her, she looked angry, like really angry. I kept trying to lightheartedly kid around with her, but she just had that mean look carved on her face. When I tried talking to her, she looked angry, like really angry. I tried to lightheartedly kid around with her, but she just had that mean look carved on her face. One of my uncles eventually pulled me aside and told me that she was sick and that I shouldn't take her cold shoulder personally. I shrugged it off and continued mingling at the party. A little while later, while I was eating, my great aunt approached me and said in an angry, almost nervous voice, I know you're not my nephew. I demand to know what you did with him. I was shocked, and I didn't know what to say. I think at that moment that I had made some stupid joke, but her stone-cold expression never changed. I just walked away, and I wanted to get as far away from my aunt as possible. It had dawned on me when I walked away that my Aunt Angela hadn't seen me since I was much younger. I moved away at 18, but I don't think that she had seen me for years even before that. I felt bad for my poor aunt. Whatever condition she had, she couldn't process that I had aged quite a bit. Throughout the entire party, I noticed that she continued staring at me. It was uncomfortable, but I learned to get over it. As the party guests started to thin out, I decided to use the restroom. We had the party at my parents' house and the bathroom was in the back of the house. He had to go down a long hallway and then it was the last room on the left. After I did my business and opened the door, I thought that I could hear sniffling. It sounded like crying. Across the hall from the bathroom was an old bedroom. It was my brother's room growing up, but now it was just sort of like a guest room with a twin bed. Sitting on the edge of the bed was my great aunt Angela and she was crying. I should have probably grabbed my mom, but I went into the room and tried to console my aunt. I put my hand on her back and asked her what was wrong, and she looked at me with these huge tear-filled eyes and said, My poor nephew is dead, and you're the monster who took him away. Before I could even begin to react to that insane statement, Aunt Angela pulled out these small black tweezers and started stabbing me in the neck. I yelled, jumped back. I heard the tweezers hit the ground and I instantly grabbed my neck and barged out of my spare room. I started making my way down the hall back to the kitchen. And then the saddest and most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me happened. My aunt Angela ran out of the room and started chasing me down the hallway like a woman possessed. I had no idea how to react to this since my great aunt was an elderly woman. She was screaming and cackling and holding the tweezers above her head like an ancient soldier with a sword. I ran into the kitchen holding my neck, screaming that my aunt wanted to stab me. Thankfully, my mom and uncle restrained my aunt Angela, who at this point was just on some other planet. 
Her eyes had nearly gone to the back of her head and she was yelling about avenging her nephew. Nobody could tell my aunt that I was her nephew. It was really sad, but she couldn't accept it for some reason. In hindsight, the story is infinitely more sad than scary and she ended up passing away several months after this incident. I can't imagine losing that much of my brain. It's a nightmare for me to even think about. I'm lucky that she was only able to find tweezers. She broke my skin and gave me a pretty nice gash on my neck. And you can imagine if she had actually found a knife or some other sharp object, she might have literally killed me. This year I told my parents, please, no more surprise parties. I'm still getting over the shock of last year. I always liked birthday parties as a kid, especially the early teenage years. We would play video games, have basketball tournaments outside, and just hang out and be idiot boys. As I got older, they lost a little bit of that shine. My friends became less obsessed with sports and video games and more obsessed with girls. I never had that crazy teenage boy desire to talk to every single girl I laid my eyes on. I was the guy who fell for one girl and that was it. I only wanted to date her, but I was way too shy to ever initiate any sort of move. I was in 11th grade and we went to my friend Mark's house for a sleepover birthday party. I was excited, nervous, and incredibly anxious because the girl I liked was going to be there and I knew my friends were going to try and start something between us. We all loved Mark's house growing up. It was secluded and the kicker to all of this was this house had butted up against the back of a cemetery. When we were younger, we would tell ghost stories and try and scare each other, but the older we got, we would mostly just dare each other to jump the fence and stay in the graveyard for a certain amount of time. I didn't believe in ghosts or anything like that, so I was always the one who went into the graveyard. I couldn't be brave enough around the girls, so I needed to show my fearlessness in other ways, so I became the kid who would do any dare. I don't know if kids still do this today, but... When we were that age, we played a lot of truth or dare. That was the game to play around the girls because you never know what you might get dared into doing. However, because all the girls were there, I was terrified to say dare because I didn't want to get dared to kiss Lily, especially not in front of all my friends. But the peer pressure of high school kicked in and I didn't want to be labeled a coward, so I said dare in an attempt to look cool, collected, and brave. And just as I feared, my friend Mark dared me to take Lily into the graveyard for 10 minutes and we couldn't come out until the 10 minute timer went up. I realized that 10 minutes doesn't sound like a long time but in my teenage brain, being alone with Lily for 10 minutes may as well have been a death sentence for my embarrassment. And Lily jumped right up, seeming eager and said, heck yeah, I'm down, let's do it, come on. And she actually extended her hand to help me out of the beanbag chair that I remember I was sitting in. I could see out of the corner of my eye my friends jostling each other with this sort of excitement and they knew what they were doing. My heart was jumping out of my chest at this point. Not because of the cemetery, but because of the whole situation. Trust me, if I could accurately depict the nerves and fear that I felt in that moment, it'd be the scariest story you've ever read in your life, but unfortunately, I have no idea how to accurately relay this information to you. Anyone out there who has crippling anxiety like me, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about here. Anyway, we make our way over the fence and into the cemetery. Even though I was nervous, I started to feel an incredible calm feeling coming over me. Lily was walking close to me and made some comments about forgetting about the 10 minute timer and that we should just stay there for a while and just hang out. Sure, it was objectively creepy being in the cemetery, but not really scary. Mark's house was a nice neighborhood and I had been to that graveyard a million times so I wasn't worried about anything actually happening. We found this huge tree and she pulled me over to the tree and we sat down and started making some harmless small talk. I was actually about to make a move when we heard the sound of some tree twigs snapping I think and both of our ears perked up. It was that hard snapping sound, it didn't sound like nature just being nature. It sounded like a tree branch being stepped on by somebody. My first thought was fear that someone else was there, but when I looked at Lily, she just seemed annoyed. 
That's when she told me that she had assumed that someone from the party was there spying on them or trying to scare us, and it made all the sense in the world. I stood up and started to scan the surroundings, and that's when I saw what looked like two heads hiding behind a gravestone. I started approaching that grave, ready to give my friends a piece of my mind, and that's when I got a good look at the two hiding people. In that instant, I realized that these were not my friends. These two people were clearly somewhere in their mid-thirties, I would have to guess. A disheveled looking man, and a woman who looked like she hadn't slept in weeks with her hair flying in every direction possible. I screamed some obscenity and Lily and I ran back to Mark's house. We got inside and locked the door and we were both freaking out and everyone at the party was more confused than concerned. Mark and my friends just laughed, assuming that we were making it up to get out of that alone time. But thankfully, Lily saw them too and she actually corroborated my story. After some back and forth, one of my friends just said it was probably another couple just trying to have some alone time as well, and we interrupted them. That was the story everyone accepted, but I saw the look in their eyes, and something didn't feel right about those two in that cemetery. Well, the night continued, and the girls eventually left for the night. We were all crashing in Mark's living room since there were about seven of us guys, and I couldn't sleep at all. Between Lily on my mind and the two freaks in the cemetery, my mind was just racing. A little after three in the morning, I thought that I could hear a shuffling sound outside the house. I woke up my friend Nick and told him that I heard something. He heard the same sound but was trying to convince me that it was just the wind or maybe even a deer. For some reason, I felt very compelled to pull back the curtain in front of the sliding door. And when I pulled it back, right on the other side of the glass was two people, and in that moment, with the light coming through, I could immediately tell that it was the two people that I had seen earlier. The man had his hand on the door trying to open it, and the woman was standing behind him almost like some sort of disgusting statue. Both of them had these just dead, very unnerving eyes. It was a brief deer-in-the-headlights type moment where we just stared at each other and then the panic and fear kicked in. My friend Nick and I screamed at the top of our lungs. All of our friends woke up, and those two creeps ran out into the night. But thankfully, all my friends saw the two people running away. And now they believe me that the two creeps that I saw earlier had ill intentions, and they definitely meant some sort of harm. Mark woke up his parents, who tried to understand the story. At first, they were reluctant to call the police because they assumed that we were pulling a prank on them or something, but they did eventually call the cops, but as far as I know, nothing ever happened. Mark's family installed a security camera by the sliding door after that, but Mark said that he never saw anything like that again. I don't think we ever went to Mark's very much after that night, and you really can't blame us. That was one of my worst memories that ever took place on a birthday, and I'll never get the look of their eyes out of my mind. Over ten years later, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I suppose it's possible that I have been a little overprotective of my daughter. Over the last year or so, I've been trying to cut the cord, so to speak, and allow my daughter to have more independence. Almost a year ago, I allowed her to have a sleepover for her birthday party. She was turning 12, and I knew most of her friends, and they were all good kids. All but one. Her friend that I'm going to call Katie in this story was just that typical bad news girl. She came from a pretty rough family, and it showed. My daughter was always friends with her, but the older they got, I could see Katie going down a darker path. A few weeks before the party, Katie got suspended for hitting a teacher. The only reason that she didn't get expelled was because my daughter wrote a letter to the principal, basically begging them to give her another chance, and they did. I was on the fence about letting Katie come over, but my daughter begged me and I gave in. And what harm could a 12-year-old girl cause in one night? The night came and it was just me alone responsible for the girls who came over. My husband works overnight, so he wasn't going to be home until 8 in the morning. 
I was a little nervous about having all the kids in the house, but I trusted my daughter to be responsible and keep everyone under control, which, for the most part, she did. Even Katie was well-behaved and even respectful. She thanked me twice for allowing her to come over. When I was getting ready for bed, I checked in with the girls and told them to behave. As I was walking away, Katie said one last time with sort of a bit of mischief in her voice, Thanks again for letting me come over. When I turned back and smiled, she looked at me in a sort of funny way, and I got the sense that she sort of ironically was thanking me now. I was hoping that my daughter didn't tell her that I didn't want her there, but I was sure that I was just overthinking this. At some point in the middle of the night, I heard a loud bang coming from down the hall. It was like the sound of a pan falling off the shelf or something. I froze for a minute thinking about the horrible idea of an intruder, and I went into bear mob mode and decided to investigate the noise. When I got into the hallway, I could hear the muffled sounds of whispers, and one of the whispers was very aggressive and angry sounding, but I couldn't make out the words. The other whisper was clearly the sound of someone whimpering. I could hear things like, please no, and we don't have to do this. I didn't have any idea what to think at this point, and I turned the light on in the hallway and the whispers stopped immediately. I heard the light footsteps of jogging heading back in the direction of the living room. I still didn't know if those whispers were some of the girls or somebody else. I briskly made my way down the hall into the kitchen. I still haven't said anything, and the light was on and there was a pan lying on the counter. It looked like it must have fallen out of the strainer where it was drying. That must have been the noise that woke me up. As I was moving the pan back into the strainer, I noticed one of the steak knives was removed from the knife block that I kept on my counter. I'm very meticulous about my kitchen, so the fact that a knife was missing gave me an immediate pause. I rushed to the living room and was relieved when I saw all of the girls sleeping. I was wired after this. I was trying to figure out what on earth the two girls in the kitchen were talking about, and more importantly, why was a knife missing? I decided to stay in the kitchen and just read until the sun came up, which was only a few hours away at that point. I just felt like I needed to stay awake, just in case something might happen. Not long after, I made a cup of coffee and started reading. Katie came to the doorway and asked what I was doing awake. I told her I couldn't sleep and I was going to read in the kitchen. She looked annoyed and confused and eventually turned back around and went to sleep. I just assumed that she got up to use the restroom, but it didn't occur to me until later that when she confronted me in the kitchen, she never went to the bathroom, so she literally got up just to confront me, which in hindsight is a little weird, at least I think so. Morning finally came and all the girls were just being silly in the living room. I made them some pancakes and the strange uneasiness eventually faded away. One by one, the girls were getting picked up, I just happened to be standing near the living room when Katie was packing up her bag and I noticed her putting the kitchen knife in her bag. I know I'm a coward, but I didn't say anything. Now say what you will, but in that moment, I felt genuine fear. Something was not right. Katie, who thanked me several times the night before, left and just looked at me when she did. I said goodbye and she turned and left without saying anything. Thankfully, nothing more happened regarding this story. Well, at least nothing that I know of anyway. I have no idea what Katie wanted to do with that knife, and I had no idea who the other girl crying was that night. I still have nightmares sometimes thinking about what would have happened if I didn't wake up that night. Did I potentially stop Katie from doing something really heinous? Was I the target? Now, I'm sure I'm overthinking this. My husband thinks it's a stretch to think a 12-year-old can be such a monster and also is pretty frustrated at me for just letting her leave with some of our kitchenware. But I don't know. My gut is telling me another story completely. What do you guys think? Three years ago, me and all my girlfriends were single for most of the year. When it came time to celebrate my birthday, I told the girls that I wanted to go dancing. There was this sort of newish club that had opened downtown and it seemed like an awesome way to celebrate my 26th. 
We just wanted to dance and not really worry about relationships or any of that stuff that could potentially just ruin the evening, and no toxic relationships on that night. Well, instead of a night of fun and dancing that I could remember forever, I instead left with a memory that has burned into my brain for all the wrong reasons. And maybe this story isn't your typical scary story, but if you were in my shoes, I bet that you would feel a certain way as well. The night started great, just as I wanted. We danced like we were never going to dance again, and we were all wearing some pretty cute dresses and heels, and I couldn't imagine the night really going any better. But that's when the power went out. Like it just completely died. It was so dark in the club that you just couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And I hate the dark, especially that kind of darkness. But honestly, in this specific situation, it was actually kind of funny. Everyone was screaming and just sort of shouting in joy, and it turned into sort of a makeshift mosh pit of sorts. Everyone was laughing and continued singing the song that was playing before the blackout. It was almost as if the nightclub sort of engineered this moment. You would think a blackout like this with all those people would induce a fear reaction, but instead, it was the weird moment of joy. During the loud blackout mosh pit, I thought that I heard someone crying, but I couldn't focus on the voice due to all the shouting going on around me. Then I heard the sound of a blood-curdling loud scream. It was the only time in my life that I felt like I could hear pain and life being drained in just that scream. And just writing it down now is reminding me of it and it just sends a shiver down my spine. I tried grabbing one of my friends but it was just too dark to see. I pulled out the flashlight on my phone and with the little bit of light that it was giving off, it was clear that nobody cared about it and especially my friends. As I was trying to get my attention of a friend, I heard someone behind me scream help. It was that same voice of whoever just had that loud scream seconds before. I turned around, but I couldn't make out anyone in distress. It was just so dark, and with everyone jumping around and being loud, it was impossible to focus on anything. Everyone just kept laughing, singing. I think due to the nature of the situation, everyone just assumed someone was making a joke and nobody really cared. This was just part of the party. A lot of people had their phone lights out now and they were jumping up and down creating this weird strobe effect. I needed to get out of the club. Maybe it was just the darkness getting to me but I felt like I was having an anxiety attack. I grabbed one of my friend's arms and basically dragged her outside with me. And she knew something was wrong and she put her arm around me. I told her I needed air and I mentioned to her that I heard someone screaming and saying help. She told me she heard it too but according to her it just didn't seem serious. She just assumed it was someone clowning around playing a joke since it was so dark in the inside of the club. She even used the word paranoid to describe my emotions at that moment and I have to say I wasn't pleased. I tried describing the scream to her and she didn't hear it the way that I did. But she did admit that she wasn't really paying attention. If I hadn't heard the crying sound before, I may not have thought that the scream was as bad as it was. And a couple of minutes had gone by and before we knew it, the club was surrounded by dozens of sirens. Police cars and ambulances were flooding the outside of the club. We looked on trying to figure out what was happening and we saw several EMTs run inside with a stretcher. It was conveniently around this time that the power had gone back on in the club. And just then, we heard the sounds of screams and gasps coming from inside the club and the music cut off almost as soon as it turned back on. When we tried to re-enter the club, there was a cop who wouldn't let us back in. And a couple of minutes later, the EMTs were coming out with someone on a stretcher that looked completely unconscious. We noticed from the doorway that the cops inside had a few people apprehended and they were also interviewing some people as well. We tried eavesdropping, but we couldn't hear anything. The person on the stretcher was put into the ambulance and they drove off quickly with the sirens blaring. What's crazy about all this is that it happened in the span of like a minute or two. It definitely put a sour taste in my mouth for my birthday. Truthfully, I don't think whatever happened that night was an accident, which is what my friends think. I think someone with intent and malice hurt a targeted individual. Why else would the police have suspects apprehended? I mean, it was within seconds of the power going out that I heard the crying and then the scream, and I never saw anything else followed up on this, and I'm just writing this now because I'm curious. 
Do you think I'm crazy or do you agree with me? Or do you think it was a setup from the beginning? The events of this story take place 14 or 15 years ago. My daughter was still young and wanted to do everything with her mother. I was still young at that point too and had much more energy to do things that I don't do now. It's funny how certain memories and moments stick out to you as a mother. You cherish those particular moments and times even as your young children get older and start having families of their own. Anyway, my daughter was invited to a birthday party of one of her elementary school friends. I don't remember their name as my daughter never became close friends with her, but it was a small school so almost every child was invited. I think the party took place at a Chuck E. Cheese, but it honestly could have been one of those off-brand places that looked just like Chuck E. Cheese. I remember it being a pretty uneventful day. The kids got food, tokens, and dessert and were able to play in the ball pit and other play places. My daughter was usually pretty shy, so she hung out with me for some of the day, but eventually warmed up and played some of the games, and ventured into the ball pit with some of her friends. I remember bringing a book to read while she was playing, and even though when she wasn't with me, I always kept an eye on her to make sure that she was okay. Even back then, you had to worry about creeps hanging around those places, or God forbid someone trying to lure them away and out the door. Shortly after the pizza was served, someone sat next to me and said, Hey, how are you, stranger? I was a little startled and taken aback, so I snapped my head back and saw that it was Janice. Now you might be asking, who is Janice? Well, she was one of my least favorite co-workers of all time who had recently been fired, thankfully, so I hadn't seen them in a few months. She was looking at me, eyes wide open, smiling from ear to ear with her face absolutely caked with makeup and her hair looking like she had just left the salon. She was blinking, but still staring at me when I realized that I was sitting there and hadn't responded. And I just sort of said in this unenthusiastic voice, Hey, what's going on? And she smiled and said, Oh, I'm just here for the party. What about you? Same, I replied. And then Janice asked me which one was mine. I pointed her out and then she goes on to say, Wow, a beauty just like her mother. I still remember those weird words that she said all those years ago. And I just nodded and then went back to some food that was on my plate. Janice went on and said, Well, hey, I don't want to keep you, but I have an amazing new job that's paying way more than before, and I'd love to get you into one of the openings. Maybe we can talk about it over coffee sometime. Taken aback by this, I just said, Sure. And I said again, just trying to end the conversation. Janice grabbed a pen and paper from her purse and jotted down my number, which I wish that I had given a fake number in hindsight. I told Janice that I was going to go check on my daughter and I would talk to her later. I didn't see Janice for the rest of the day and was thankful when the party was over as I knew my daughter would be exhausted and take a nap and I could sit on the couch and dive into my book. When I was home I started reading my book and then felt myself drifting off and the next thing that I knew I was jolted awake by the sound of the phone ringing. I honestly was so tired that I didn't get off the couch to answer it. As I laid back down trying to see if I could fall back asleep, the phone started ringing again. I got up and answered it and was shocked to hear the voice coming from the other end. Well, hello, stranger. What's with the Irish goodbye? And it was Janice, the co-worker. I could tell as soon as she spoke, but I replied, Who is this? It's Janice, silly, calling to set up our coffee day to discuss that job opportunity. I tried to be as polite as possible and tell her that I was busy and that me and my husband had a lot going on, and she just went silent and was saying things like, oh, okay, and I understand. I got off the phone quickly, assuming that that was the end of that. And over the next few days, I noticed the phone ringing more than usual. I would get up to answer it, and it would have hung up by the time I answered, or no one would speak on the other end. My husband even took notice of it. He mentioned that when I was out getting groceries, he answered the phone three times and one time it sounded like someone was just breathing on the other end. I didn't think much of it and it faded away in my mind over the next few days. 
When my daughter was at school, my husband at work, and I was on PTO and had just gotten done cleaning the entire house and folding laundry, I remember hearing loud knocking at the door like someone was beating it down. I slowly crept towards the door to see if it was someone trying to break in or trying to break their hand against the door, which is what it sounded like. I peered out the blinds in the living room but couldn't see who was at the door. I slowly opened it with the chain lock still attached. I heard someone say, There you are, sleepyhead. And peering through the crack in the door, I could see that it was Janice. And very annoyed, I asked, What are you doing here? Are you trying to break the door? She let out some weird laugh and said, I wanted to stop by to talk about that job. Half in shock, I respond, How do you know where I live? And she said, well, I had your number and your name, so I was able to find out from, you know, sources. And I didn't know how to respond. I just remembered saying that now isn't a good time, and please don't show up here unannounced again. Before I slammed the door shut, I heard her say, Well, we've been playing phone tag every time I called. I went to my window and just watched. She stood on the porch for a while with this disgusted, miserable look on her face and then slowly sauntered to her car and drove off. I told my husband about it and he said to make sure that the doors were always locked and let him know if anything else weird happened. But honestly, after that day, I didn't notice anything. The phone went back to normal and thankfully there were no unannounced visits. When I got back to work, I told a few co-workers the story and they stopped me and said, Janice? You know why she got fired, right? And I didn't at the time. They went on to tell me that she got caught stealing, and when confronted, she threatened a few people and said some really awful stuff. And after I did some digging, I found out that it was so awful that she was arrested and apparently had to have a behavioral health assessment. Also, she didn't have a job at the time. Someone else saw her at a bar and she said that she was in between jobs. I didn't say much after that and just went back to work, but all day in my mind it was racing about what she could have wanted, especially showing up at my house. Was she trying to steal from me? Did I do something at work to make her angry and she wanted to get back at me? After a week or two, it had left my mind until my husband was watching the news and there was a report of a break-in and burglary in a neighboring part of town. And guess who? It was Janice and she had an accomplice, and they were charged. Thankfully, since that day, I've never heard her name or seen her, but every now and again, I still wonder what would have happened if I let her in my house. So I move all the time because of my job. It sucks because I never have time to form real relationships, either intimate ones or even just friends. I'm friendly with everyone at work, but never make those personal connections. I will admit that some of the blame lies on me. I've been asked to hang out before at other job locations, but I usually turn it down because I'd rather just go home. I guess I have no real reason to complain. I don't know if this is the wrong thing to say, but my brother also said that I have old man syndrome meaning that I just want to work and go home alone. I hate to say it, but unfortunately, he's not wrong. I can't remember exactly how many years ago this was, but one day at the job, a coworker I'm not fond of found out it was my birthday. All day long, he was jostling me around and practically begging me to go out for a drink or two to celebrate. This was the last thing I wanted to do, but at the same time, I really wanted to get out more. Breaking out of the stupid shell that I was always in, and throughout the day, he would constantly poke his head into my office to say, Tonight, bro. I would usually just nod and go along with it. And at one point during the day, he told me that a lot of people from work were going to celebrate my birthday and that I couldn't bail now. And I hate to say it, but his stupid plan worked. I felt guilty. If all my coworkers were going to come out to celebrate me, I would have to join them since I'm technically the man of the hour. We all worked until 9 p.m. that night. A few nights a month, we would have to stay until 9 to basically just go over documents. Around 7, I found my coworker and told him that I would join him at the bar after work, but that we would have to go right after work and that I wasn't going to stay out too late. 
He was pumped and kept telling me that he'd get me home early and not to worry. A little after nine, I was walking to my car with my coworker and asked him what bar we were going to. I was still new to the area, so I wasn't 100% sure where everything was located, especially at night. After a little debate, my coworker insisted on driving, making some stupid argument like it was my birthday and that he insisted on driving me just in case I wanted to have a good time. I was tired and I didn't feel like arguing with him. Also, I'm not much of a drinker, so I was worried that I wouldn't be able to hold my alcohol, so it was probably best that I didn't drive just in case. While we were driving at the bar, we just made some small talk. It dawned on me that during that drive, I didn't know this coworker really at all. He talked to me all the time at my job, but I never really talked back, and this was the most intimate setting that I was ever in with him, and I really didn't like it. Thankfully, he talked nearly the entire car ride with very little interjection from me. We got to the bar, and it was moderately full. I noticed right away that none of my coworkers were inside, but I didn't say anything. A few minutes passed by, and my coworker said that everyone from work should be showing up soon and that I shouldn't worry. And I wasn't worried. Truthfully, I didn't care if they showed up at all. I wanted to drink my beer, pretend to be a good coworker, and then just go home. I thought maybe outside of work this coworker would be more tolerable, but he was even more unbearable outside of work. We'd been at the bar for about an hour making small talk. I noticed that my coworker kept making eye contact with two guys at the bar. It was always very strange looks. He'd be smiling and joking around like always and then look at one of the guys and he'd sort of frown a little bit and almost nod and go back to laughing and talking. I thought it was weird but... I kind of just blamed it on the atmosphere of the bar and drinking alcohol. Maybe with all the noise, he was just distracted or something. It happens to me all the time. And after this happened a few times, I couldn't help but feel like it was intentional and not a coincidence. But I didn't say anything. It was around this time that I kept asking to leave, but my coworker just kept begging me to stay a little while longer. He kept claiming that the other coworkers would eventually show up soon. I waited a little longer and then I finally told him that I was just leaving. I said I was going to call a cab or something since this was before Uber or any service like that. He tried to get me to stay longer but I had enough at this point and I'm not going to lie. I was a little upset that nobody from work showed up when apparently they told my coworker that they would. When my coworker realized that I wasn't going to stay, that's when he insisted on taking me home. I knew he didn't drink that much but... I just wanted to be done with this dude for the night. He's a tough man to say no to. It's probably why he's a great salesman, so I sort of caved in and just let him do it. I let him take me home. I told him where I lived, and he responded by saying, Oh, I know exactly where that is. I'll have you back in no time. I sat quietly for a few minutes of the drive, and surprisingly, so did he. Maybe this guy does have an off switch, I thought. Then I noticed that he was taking a weird way to my house. I know I didn't know a lot about the area at that time, but I knew this, so I told him that he needed to go the other way. My coworker smiled and made some comments about me being new to the area and that this was a shortcut. I just let it go, and I was done pleading with this guy because I felt like I had been doing it all night. We started going down this dark and very desolate street. It was one of those deserted streets that just had no life on it at all. It was one of those areas that was just littered with old factories and businesses that had been shut down for a long time. Even most of the street lights were off, and the ones that were on gave off such little light that you almost wouldn't even know that they were on. My coworkers started telling me how this area is very spooky now and that it was just completely abandoned. And just as he was telling me some of the stories of the factories that used to be there, he started shouting out of nowhere and pulling over the car. When I asked what was going on, he told me that he was pretty sure that he had a flat tire and that he needed to check it out quickly. He sold it very convincingly, but it didn't feel like we had a flat tire. Every time I got a flat tire while driving, you can almost feel yourself being pulled to a certain direction. He got out of the car and just as he made his way to the driver's side rear tire, a car pulls up behind us. Right as the car was pulling in behind our car, I started getting out of the car to check the tire and see if my coworker needed help putting on a spare. 
I was startled and I was hoping this car was just someone trying to help. The first thing I noticed was that my coworker started backing away from the car suspiciously, like he was moving to the middle of the road almost. Then I noticed that the tire wasn't flat at all. It was right at that moment that I noticed two men get out of the car behind us, and it was the two men from the bar that my coworker kept making eye contact with. At that moment I was speechless, and I didn't say anything. Before I could make any move, one of the men grabbed me, threw me onto the cold and beat up road, and both men started kicking me, punching me while I was on the ground. I tried screaming for a while, but it was like my voice stopped working. I could hear my coworker yelling for help, but he sounded far away. I lifted my head up from the ground and saw my coworker run back to his car, and he starts to drive off, leaving me there alone with these two guys. The beating continued for a while longer until I felt like I was going to pass out. I could eventually feel them taking my wallet and my watch, which I have to say was a nice watch, and they eventually got in their car and left. I was left in the middle of the road, just completely bloodied and bruised, and everything hurt and I just was laying there, freezing. Believe it or not, an actual homeless guy came over and helped me and helped me walk to a nearby gas station since I had no clue where I was. I was able to call the police and told them everything and gave a description of the guys. The police asked me if I thought my coworker was involved and it hadn't crossed my mind until that moment. I don't think they ever caught the two guys and my coworker claimed that he never had anything to do with the mugging. Ever since the police mentioned it to me though, I haven't been able to believe that he's innocent. I haven't been able to believe that when he left, he was just leaving to get help. When I reflect on the entire night, it just seems like everything is a little too set up. While I remained at that location for work, my coworker still remained his chipper self and always tried getting me to go out, but believe me, I never went out with him again. Whenever I would have the guts to maybe call him out, he always claimed that he had nothing to do with it and he said that he was offended I would even say something like that. I never received justice for that moment, and it still bothers me to this day. Thankfully, I have stability in my life now and a close group of friends that I can celebrate my birthday with. I just hope that I never have to experience anything that traumatic ever again. A few years ago, I worked in the main office of a large grocery store chain in my region. I honestly hated this job, but it was a decent paying job out of college. My job was extremely boring and consisted of 99% computer work. At the time of the story, I had worked at the main office for nearly two years and I had yet to really make a connection with really anyone. This may sound crazy to some people, but it was hard to make friends at this place. The hours were horrible and the workload was a pain. Most people just kept to themselves, did their work, and then left for the night. A girl I'll call Carla worked at the office who I was crushing on pretty hard at the time. I never talked to her really other than the occasional hey while passing in the hall or something like that. One Friday afternoon while my life was being drained at the computer, I got a message on my work email and it said it was from Carla. It seemed kind of random, and it seemed like it was a generic message inviting me to her birthday party that weekend. I didn't care that it wasn't a personalized message, I was just excited to be invited. This was validation for me that Carla knew that I actually existed, and the email contained an address and a time for the party, and there was a little note at the end of the message that said, please don't talk about the party out loud because not everyone in the office is invited, and I was pretty thrilled. That night when I was leaving, I saw Carla walking down the hall and we made eye contact and I smiled and said, Hey Carla. She smiled but didn't say anything back. It didn't seem like a genuine smile, more like a reaction than anything else. Just as she was almost out of sight, I said, I'll see you later. And she turned and had a confused look on her face and then just waved at me as she turned the corner. That interaction didn't give me a warm feeling in my stomach, but... We were at work after all, so maybe that was just her, it's Friday and I'm leaving attitude and also she didn't want to give away that she was having a party. 
That one night when I got home, I got ready and put the directions into my GPS. I was surprised and a little annoyed that the directions said that the party was almost 45 minutes away. But again, I had a crush on this chick, so I would have driven in an hour and 45 minutes if I had to. I made sure that I was dressed nice and left so I could arrive fashionably late. The entire duration of the drive, I was planning on what I was going to say and running through dozens of scenarios in my head. When there was about 10 minutes left until the destination, I noticed that there was nothing in sight. No lights, no houses, no cars, nothing. Wherever Carla was having this party was in the middle of nowhere. I finally arrived at the address in the email and I was just confused. There seemed to be no sign of life. It was a small rundown farmhouse that honestly looked abandoned. Not only that, but there was also no cars other than mine there. Now, I want the record to show I'm only half stupid. I knew this was wrong, and then getting out of the car was most likely a horrible idea, but I did it anyway. I thought to myself, oh, I already drove out, I might as well see what's going on with all of this. I knocked on the door several times and there was no answer, not even the sound of budging or shuffling on the other side. I tried looking through the window, but it was just too dark. I started walking back to my car and noticed a barn behind the back of the house. You couldn't see the barn from the road because the backyard where the barn was located was down a slight hill. Not to mention, it was pitch black outside. I wasn't going to investigate the barn at first. I actually started walking towards my car so I could actually message Carla. I was going to tell her that maybe she sent me the wrong address in the invitation. As I was walking away, I thought that I could hear a sound coming from said barn. I thought to myself, no, oh, maybe they're out there, and the cars are just parked somewhere else. I started walking towards the barn, hoping that I could hear maybe talking or music or anything that would indicate a birthday going on, but it was just a very eerie silence. Just as I was about to enter this barn, my brain finally kicked in and I said forget it. I turned around and jogged my car. I was upset, but I didn't want to potentially get in trouble for trespassing on some random person's property. This clearly wasn't Carla's party. As I opened the car door, I heard the sound of a heavy wooden door whip open. I turned around and saw someone running from the barn in my direction. This person was running at full speed and he was clearly making a dash directly for me. I jumped into my car and immediately started up and drove off as fast as I could. This person was able to make it to my car and banged on the side of it as I drove off and all I could hear was a low voice shouting hey as I peeled off down the road. I was terrified, confused, angry, and all sorts of emotions after that. I had no idea what had just happened. After that, I tried emailing Carla, but I never got a response back from her. Eventually, we made it to Monday at work. I approached Carla, and I apologized for not making it to her birthday party. I told her that I must have had the address wrong or something, and she looked at me like I had nine heads and asked in some confused voice, what are you talking about, my birthday was four months ago. Now I was looking at her like she had nine heads. I told her about the email, and she confirmed that it was not hers. She showed me her email address, and it was in fact a completely different one. In some ways, I was thankful that this nightmare almost happened to me because it gave me the chance to finally talk to Carla. I was the most popular guy in the office for a couple of days after that insane story, and it wasn't until after that I realized just how horrifying this actually was. Someone clearly was trying to trick me, and me alone. This was my work email that I got the invitation sent to, and that means that it was someone in the office that singled me out and dragged me out to an abandoned farm to do something that I didn't even want to think about. To this day, I had never found out who it was or why they singled me out. I never wronged anybody there and nobody to my knowledge had any issues with me. It was just some crazy story and I still get freaked out every time I think about it. I never really understood the meaning of don't meet your heroes until my 19th birthday 
Now please bear with me as I tell you this story that I've never written down before. My wife also told me not to use any of the real names of the people involved for legal reasons just in case, but better safe than sorry. And this was a long time ago. As I mentioned, it was my 19th birthday and I'm now 36 years old for reference. My girlfriend at the time had scored me ringside tickets to a WWE show that was being held in my hometown. To some people, that may seem like nothing, but back when I was a huge wrestling fan and ringside seats, they were not cheap. One of my girlfriend's friends somehow had an in with one of the wrestlers, and that's how she was able to score those ringside seats. I was so excited to see my favorite wrestler at the time, and he went on in the main event of the evening. After the match, he went around the ring and gave the audience members some high fives, and I was on cloud nine. I was shouting and trying to get his attention as he was standing right in front of me, and he completely ignored me. However, he was not ignoring my girlfriend. He winked at her and was making these really weird seductive eyes towards her. After the event, we were leaving and I didn't care about the weird interaction with my girlfriend and my favorite wrestler. These guys are like rock stars and he's a very handsome man, so I let my girlfriend just be happy that she basically got hit on by this big time wrestler. That night, we both went to our own houses since we didn't live together. While she was at home, she got a call from her friend who got her the tickets and told her that she needed to meet her right away at this local restaurant in town. There were 15 wrestlers from the roster at that time, all at this restaurant, and one of them being my favorite. My girlfriend went and she didn't call me. Long story short, my girlfriend got to meet all these wrestlers including my favorite. They partied all night and she never called or texted me once. She even exchanged numbers with my favorite wrestler and she called me the next day and I could tell something was wrong. Her voice was off. She told me what happened and she apologized a million times. She told me that she had to go alone and it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. I was devastated but I understood. She said that she was going to make it up to me that night. When I asked her how, she told me that she got VIP passes for the show that was being held in a city about an hour away. She was vague about how she scored the tickets, but I got over it quickly. I was excited to meet the wrestlers and go see another show. We got there a couple of hours before the show to meet some of the wrestlers, and I was beyond excited. Then my favorite emerged from the back and gave my girlfriend a huge hug. His hand was a little too low on her backside for comfort, but I again let it slide. I tried to introduce myself, and instead of being a stand-up human, he started laughing at me. And then I started seeing a pattern of all the wrestlers coming up to my girlfriend and greeting her like an old friend, and they were practically ignoring me. It's petty, but I felt jealous. I actually felt angrier that my girlfriend wasn't introducing me at all. Not as her boyfriend, and not even as her friend. It was like I wasn't there. My pride was hurt, and I started to notice that something wasn't right. When the meet and greet was over, we started making our way to our seats. I was grilling her about the previous night and she insisted that nothing happened, that they just hung out late and had a good time, but I didn't buy that anymore. During the show, my girlfriend got a text message. It actually came from my favorite wrestler, texting her and saying to meet them backstage after the show. We had permission from security to join them in the back, I guess. When I arrived with my girlfriend, the wrestler commented on her bringing me. I finally had enough and called him out. Now I was shaking my boots since the guy is built like a Greek god compared to me, but I had enough of this blatant disrespect. He laughed and made some comments alluding to being with my girlfriend in more than a friendly way. And at that point, in a blind rage, I just tried to tackle him. But my girlfriend started to hold me back. Now he would have killed me, so it was good that she did that. And at that moment we just left but I was shouting the entire time. I was angry at my girlfriend, sad that that wrestler was such a jerk, and anxious that something happened that I didn't know about. I was a mess as we sat in the car in the parking lot, and then my girlfriend ripped off the metaphorical band-aid. She told me everything, that after all the wrestlers were hanging out that night, she went to that wrestler's hotel room and spent the night there. I was seeing red. I tried getting out of the car and back to the arena. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I wanted to confront him. 
The great human being that my girlfriend was finally gave up and let me out of the car. I used my VIP pass to get back into the arena and I was looking for him. Well, I found out after that my girlfriend had texted him and told him that I was coming back and that I was going to try and confront him. She thought that he would come out and try to talk to me, but she was wrong. Instead, three huge wrestlers from that roster came out the back door, followed by my favorite. And there I was, some five foot six man weighing probably 150 pounds at the time, standing in the middle of these giants. And trust me, they're much larger in person than they look on TV. And instead of talking to me, or even just verbally threatening me, they proceeded to get physical with me. Then, the wrestler put his knee on my chest and put a pocket knife to my mouth and said, If you ever say anything or try to put your hands on me again, you'll be swallowing this knife, kid. Everybody else laughed and the four men got off of me and walked away. And I had never been so pissed my pants scared in my entire life. I was terrified and I was hurt, both physically and emotionally. 48 hours ago, I would have done anything to meet this guy, and tonight, he beat me up so bad that I felt like I had just gotten hit by a truck, and not to mention I'm pretty sure he just threatened my life. I ended up having a broken rib, and I did try to take legal action, but it amounted to nothing. I broke up with my girlfriend and I stopped watching wrestling. The illusion of that world was broken to me, and every time I saw that wrestler I was filled with so much anger. I know this story may not be scary to some people, but it was the worst night of my entire life. My hero beat me within inches of my life and shoved a knife in my mouth. And I would bet that if this happened to you, you'd be scared as well. Ghosts and demons stories are scary, but until something like this actually happens to you in your life, you won't know what real fear is. I've heard that this wrestler has since turned a corner in his life and is now an actually good person, but... I don't care if I ever hear his name again. I will always associate him with not only the worst birthday I ever had, but undoubtedly the worst night of my life. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays and Wednesday nights, and I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or over email, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or by clicking that big join button to become a member here on YouTube. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations, located anywhere you listen to podcasts, all links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, John Cena is a good person.